So here we are required to identify canal 1, fossa 2, and groove 3. This is a, a view of the orbits showing the anterior aspect of the orbit and the depth of the orbit. Note that the orbit is a pyramidal shaped space and at the apex of this pyramid is the canal 1. It is the optic canal. It communicates between the orbit and the middle cranial fossa and through this optic canal passes the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery. Remember that the optic nerve here is covered by meninges and cerebrospinal fluid. Fossa 2 is located on the medial side of the orbit and it is partly located in the lacrimal bone. Here is the lacrimal bone. It has an anterior lacrimal crest and this fossa is the fossa for the lacrimal sac. So the lacrimal sac is located here and it continues downwards as the nasolacrimal duct which opens into the nose. Remember that the lacrimal gland is located in the superior lateral aspect of the orbit, just beneath the roof of the orbit on its superior lateral aspect. Groove 3 is continuous from the inferior orbital fissure. This is the inferior orbital fissure. Here is the superior orbital fissure. So the inferior orbital fissure here, it communicates between the orbit and the pterygopalatine fossa on one side and the infratemporal fossa here as well. And through the groove passes the infraorbital nerve, which is a forward continuation of the maxillary nerve. Remember that the maxillary nerve is located in the pterygopalatine fossa, where the pterygopalatine ganglion is suspended from the nerve, and then it continues forwards the maxillary nerve as the infraorbital nerve. So it passes in this groove, which is the infraorbital groove. Then the groove disappears and becomes a canal, infraorbital canal, that opens here in front of the maxilla just beneath the inferior margin of the orbit as the infraorbital foramen which transmits the infraorbital nerve which muscle did messi use in winking the muscle here is the orbicularis oculi muscle and remember that it has a palpebral part which is present in the lid and an orbital part which is surrounding the uh, orbit the palpebral part is used for blinking but the orbital part is used for winking which muscle produces the dimple on his chin this dimple here is produced by a very small muscle that's attached to the skin and is called the mentalis muscle Mentalis arises from the body of the mandible, anterior to the roots of inferior incisors, and is attached to the skin of the chin. It forms the mentolabial sulcus and elevates the skin of the chin. Its excessive contraction in some people results in the cobblestone appearance of the chin. Identify the air spaces in A and identify the canal B. You can see here that the air spaces in A are located between the orbits. So this is the orbit here located laterally. You can see the shadow of the eyeball here. So these air spaces are located between the orbit on the lateral side and the nose on the medial side. This is the nasal cavity and separated by the nasal septum. So between the nasal cavity and the orbit, the air spaces here are the ethmoid air cells. And you can see that it's not a single cavity, but it's a, a group of cavities separated by bony septa. And that's why they are called ethmoidal air cells. And they can be divided into posterior, middle and anterior ethmoidal air cells. The canal B is the external auditory canal. You can see it here in continuity with the auricle. This is the auricle. And you can see that this external auditory canal is partly cartilaginous. The outer part is cartilaginous, so you cannot see a bone here. But the medial part here, it is the bony part of the uh, external auditory canal. Look at the close relationship of the external auditory canal to the temporomandibular joint. Here is the head of the mandible, and this is the temporomandibular joint. Identify the processes A and B. A is the mastoid process. It's the bony process that can be felt behind the auricle. This is where the auricle is located here. And so it can be felt, the process that can be felt behind the auricle. It's the mastoid process. First muscle that is attached to the mastoid process is the muscle that carries its name. It's the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is attached to the sternum, clavicle, 
and the mastoid process. The sternocleidomastoid is attached to the outer surface of the mastoid process, and the, on the inner surface is attached the posterior belly of digastric muscle. The other process here is the styloid process, and the name of the process describes its shape. It's like a stylus. So it's the styloid process, like a pen. There are actually three muscles attached to the styloid process. Together with the stylohyoid ligaments, they constitute what we call the styloid apparatus. So the three muscles attached here are the stylohyoid, the styloglossus, and the stylopharyngeus muscle. And as their names indicate, they are distributed to the structures indicated by their name styloglossus to the tongue, stylopharyngeus to the pharynx, and stylohyoid to the hyoid bone. And it actually is the muscle that accompanies the posterior belly of digastric coming from the mastoid process. And both of them, stylohyoid and posterior belly of digastric, are supplied by the facial nerve, while styloglossus as a muscle of the tongue is supplied by the hypoglossal nerve and the stylopharyngeus is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve is the only muscle that is supplied by this nerve so three muscles attached to the bone and each one of them has a different nerve supply identify the vessels a to e here the ascending ramus and part of the body of the mandible have been removed and we can see some of the structures including the vessels that are located in the infratemporal fossa medial to the ramus of the mandible the lateral pterygoid muscle has been removed here as well the big artery here ascending upward c is the external carotid artery and you can see here it's two terminal branches the two terminal branches that are given at the level of the neck of the mandible. Here is the superficial temporal A and then the maxillary artery B. You can see the maxillary artery will disappear because it enters into the pterygomaxillary fissure into the pterygopalatine fossa. One of the major branches of the maxillary artery is this one going downwards. It's the inferior alveolar artery. It goes into the substance of the mandible into the bone inside the bone into the mandibular canal and accompanied by the inferior alveolar nerve the inferior alveolar artery supplies the roots of the mandibular teeth the other artery here e given from the external carotid artery before the artery goes upwards it's uh, given in the neck and it passes around the inferior border of the mandible goes to the face uh, you can see its tortuous course here it goes upwards and medially until it reaches the medial canthus of the eye this is the facial artery identify the bones a and b b specific this is a view of the heart palate and you can see here that the heart palate is formed of these two bones this is the palatine process of the maxilla and this is the horizontal plate of the palatine bone so the an anterior two-thirds of the heart palate is formed by the palatine process of the maxilla and the posterior third is formed by the horizontal process of the palatine bone. Identify the nerves A to E, which one of them supplies the muscle indicated by the star. The area here is on the side of the neck, posterior to sternocleidomastoid muscle. So this is sternocleidomastoid, here is trapezius muscle, and the triangle is the posterior triangle. And these nerves, A, B, C, and D, they arise from behind sternocleidomastoid. They are the cutaneous branches of the cervical plexus formed from anterior primary rami of spinal nerves C1 to C4. They are cutaneous branches, and they separate from each other in a radial manner. A is the transverse cervical and supplies the skin over the middle part of the neck. B ascends towards the angle of the mandible and this is the great auricular nerve it supplies the skin over the angle of the mandible and the parotid gland the only part of the face that is not supplied by the trigeminal nerve and c passes behind the auricle and this is the lesser occipital nerve which supplies part of the skin behind the auricle d uh, is a group of nerves actually we can see only one of them here this structure is not a nerve by the way this is the external jugular vein, which descends vertically downwards over the obliquely running sternocleidomastoid muscle. So 
D goes downward to the tip of the shoulder. Here is the region of the tip of the shoulder. And these groups of nerves are called supraclavicular nerves. They supply the skin over the uh, shoulder and the upper half of deltoid muscle. E is in fact the accessory nerve. This is derived from the spinal root of the accessory nerve. It leaves behind the sternocleidomastoid between its uh, upper third and middle third of the muscle, goes downward into the posterior triangle of the neck, superficial to levator scapulae muscle. This muscle is levator scapulae, and then it disappears into trapezius muscle, anterior border of trapezius, between its middle third and lower third. Actually, this nerve E is the motor nerve for both sternocleidomastoid and trapezius. So for answering part two, the nerve that supplies the muscles indicated by the star, it is E, not the other nerves, because all the other nerves are cutaneous branches of the cervical plexus. They are not motor. Identify the structures one to four in this horizontal section. This is a horizontal section of the front of the head. The, you can see here clearly this is the eyeball. Uh, this is the retroorbital fat. And uh, this region is a gland, actually. It's located in the superior lateral aspect of the orbit. It is the lacrimal gland. At the apex of the orbit here, you can see a nerve passing from this region. This is the middle cranial fossa, region of the middle cranial fossa. Here's the optic canal. And this is the optic nerve. And medial to the orbit, separating the orbit from the nose, are a group of air cells, which are the ethmoidal air cells. So three is the anterior group of ethmoidal air cells, anterior ethmoidal air cells. Two is located on the lateral side, behind the orbit, lateral to the temporal bone. And this muscle is, actually it is temporalis muscle, one of the four muscles of mastication. Identify the foramen, what passes through it. Let's first of all be oriented. This is a view of the base of the skull showing the biggest foramen, foramen magnum, from below. And these are the occipital condyles. These openings here are located behind the occipital condyles, and they are called the condylar canals. And these condylar canals, they transmit an emissary vein between the sigmoid sinus, which is located inside the cranial cavity, and the veins that are located outside the skull. So such type of veins that communicate between the veins inside and outside the skull are called emissary veins. And these veins are so variable, so as these foramina. So the foramina might be present bilaterally, maybe present unilaterally, or maybe absent in many of the skulls. And this is just an anatomical variation. The important thing is that not to confuse this foramen, which is the condylar canal, with the foramen that is supposed to be located at this location here, just above the condylar process and above the foramen magnum, and that is the hypoglossal canal, which transmits the hypoglossal nerve. This foramen, the hypoglossal canal, is uh, always present and is located above the occipital condyle and not behind it like here. 